Uh, okay, so uh, good morning to everyone and uh, welcome to today's uh, MAX seminar or webinar. And uh, today the topic is all electron density functional theory using the FLIRP code. I am Gregor Michalicek and I will be the speaker for the first uh, talk. But uh, let me first uh, give you an overview of uh, what topics uh, will be discussed today. So, as mentioned, I will introduce uh, you to the FLIR code and to the FLAPW method that is actually the DFT method that is um, uh, implemented in FLIR. Um, afterwards, uh, Uljana Alekseva will tell you something about pushing FLIR to the limits and uh, she will give you examples on large magnetic setups that we can calculate. And in the end, Daniel Wortmann uh, will tell you uh, how to get FLIR on your machine and how the future of FLIR looks like. So before I dive into my talk, uh, let me give you a few remarks on questions. So uh, you probably see that you have some Q&A button uh, probably uh, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, you can use it to ask questions during the talk in text form. And these questions uh, will be answered by the speakers that uh, are not speaking at the moment. Um, and uh, if there are leftover questions, uh, then uh, these questions will be answered um, in a very short uh, session after all three talks have uh, finished. Um, you will also get a few questions, and I think it's three questions over, the, uh, over all three talks, and uh, about your background, um, because this uh, information would be very useful for us, and uh, please answer them. So, um, let's start with the first talk. Um, so this is the introduction to FLIR and FLAPW, and uh, this is the outline. So um, I will start by giving you some theoretical background on the method uh, by introducing you to the LAPW basis and uh, show you how to treat we, the, the core electrons and the valence electrons. Uh, I will tell you something about local orbitals uh, and, and about film setups. Then. We, uh, I will show you how to obtain high precision uh, results with uh, the FLIR code. And uh, actually, I will uh, go into a few examples to show you what you, what you actually have to look at. Um, then I will uh, give you a short sketch about the strength, challenges, and the features of FLIR, and uh, give you a um, short introduction how to use FLIR, and finally conclude the talk. Before I go into the uh, theoretical background, uh, let me give you a short overview about what FLIR actually is. So FLIR is an FLAPW DFT code. Uh, that means that it treats all electrons, so the core electrons and the valence electrons within the DFT self consistency cycle. And FLAPW actually stands for full potential linearized augmented plane waves. And uh, so full potential means we don't have any shape approximation to the potential and linearized augmented plane waves is uh, the basis set that we use. FLIR is an open source code. It stands under the MIT license and uh, it has many features. Uh, I will give you later um, a more impressive overview about uh, on this, but uh, just to mention a few, we have spin orbit coupling, non-collinear magnetism. Uh, we have implemented many exchange correlation functionals, uh, forces, of course, and we can do calculations uh, with up to uh, several thousand of atoms uh, by now. Uh, so and that was quite an achievement that we uh, uh, got during uh, the max time up to now. So uh, historically, uh, the code uh, is mainly developed in Gülich and uh, was uh, uh, strongly used uh, to describe complex magnetic systems, surface magnetism, but uh, in general we have uh, more like this environment of application. So uh, we are interested in the interplay between atomic structure, electronic structure, and magnetic structure. So uh, for example, multiferroics is uh, also a big topic for us and for users of the code in general. Um, so let's uh, dive into this uh, theoretical background and uh, let's start this with uh, providing a more uh, formal um, placement of uh, FLIR within uh, the MAX project. So I show here the cone charm equations, obviously, and uh, in red I show 
what actually applies to uh, the FLIR code. So for example, uh, uh, for the kinetic energy, um, we uh, have non-relativistic treatment, scalar relativistic treatment, and fully relativistic treatment, depending on what electrons we actually describe and where in space we describe them. Um, of course, we have several uh, exchange correlation functionals implemented, and uh, but the main point that distinguishes us from um, other codes in uh, the MAX project is uh, the basis set and the treatment of the uh, of the electrons. So, as mentioned, uh, we have an all electron code, and uh, this means we don't use a pseudo potential, and. Uh, this actually, uh, this choice is strongly connected to the basis set. Uh, uh, you see we have linear augmented plane waves, and uh, I think, for example, um, the siesta code uh, uses a linear combination of atomic orbitals, and uh, quantum espresso uses um, plane waves with the uh, projector augmented wave uh, approach. So, um, let me show you the linear augmented plane wave basis. It looks like this. So it is based on a partitioning of space of the unit cell into different regions. So on the one hand, we have these uh, muffin tin spheres around each atom, and then we have this interstitial region in between the muffin tin spheres. The muffin tin spheres are nearly touching um, because this is efficient in the description. Um, so within the interstitial region, um, the basis consists of uh, well, each basis function is uh, a plane wave there. And uh, in the uh, muffin tin spheres, uh, we have an expansion in terms of radial functions times uh, spherical harmonics. And uh, the radial functions are, uh, well, you, you see them here. They consist of uh, these functions u and u dot. And we have uh, these expansion coefficients a and b. And these expansion coefficients are actually determined by enforcing um, continuity and value and slope at the muffin tin sphere boundary. So they're matched to the uh, plane wave and the interstitial region. So this u and u dot are actually solutions and energy derivatives for the spherical potential at uh, predefined or uh, well, energy, parame er energy parameters that uh, are automatically determined. Let's say it like that. And uh, on the uh, lower right side of the slide, you uh, see a sketch of uh, how such a basis function may look like. So, um, as said, we have plane waves in the interstitial. And of course, uh, if we have such a plane wave expansion of our um, cone charm orbitals, uh, there has to be some cutoff parameter, and uh, this is the cutoff parameter k max. And uh, in the muffin tin spheres, uh, we have these uh, radial functions u and u dot. And of course, um, increasing this k max uh, does not uh, give us more variational freedom uh, in the muffin tin spheres. We are still restricted to this, uh, these radial functions u and u dot. But in the end, we want to um, describe a solution to the Schrödinger equation uh, at some uh, eigenenergy epsilon. And what we actually can do is uh, we have a linearized description of this uh, by using this u at the energy parameter e, l alpha, and uh, the energy derivative uh, ul dot. What we don't have are higher order terms at the moment. But uh, fortunately, this description is sufficient to obtain highly accurate and precise results for many materials. Um, nevertheless, uh, there is uh, this linearization error that may become relevant for some uh, setups. So um, what do we do with the uh, core electrons? So up to now, this was the description of the valence electrons. And uh, it turns out that this LAPW basis is orthogonal to the core electron states, at least as long as uh, the core electron states vanish at the muffin tin sphere boundary. So this is an assumption that goes into the proof uh, when you uh, actually want to sh show this. Um, so uh, the good side of this is that uh, this allows us to separate the determination of the core electron wave functions and energies from the determination of uh, the same for the valence electrons. And uh, we can treat uh, the core electrons in a 
fully relativistic way and uh, actually can uh, calculate them uh, separately for each atom on a radial mesh. So, but all of this um, takes place within the cell consistency. So, um, it is based on the effect effective potential that we have in each iteration. So, uh, the valence electrons uh, we represent by the LAPW basis, and we have a scalar relativistic description in the muffin tin spheres there. So, when I said uh, that we solved the Schrödinger equation, that actually is a lie. We solved the scalar relativistic uh, approximation to the Dirac equation there. So, um, of course, we can also include spin orbit coupling if uh, this uh, is required for the uh, system we want to investigate. Um, so, as mentioned, um, this orthogonality property between the uh, uh, LAPW basis and the core electron states only holds when uh, these uh, states vanish at muffin tin sphere boundary. But of course, um, if uh, we have a semi core states, so uh, energetically high lying uh, core states, uh, then these states may be extended beyond the uh, muffin boundaries, and this can lead to so called ghost bands. And I will show you an example for this later. So, um, I will show you an example for this later, but uh, I will show you now how to uh, deal with these things. So, uh, we can actually uh, extend our LAPW basis with so-called local orbitals, and uh, they look like uh, what I show here. So we again have these functions uh, u and u dot in the muffin tin spheres, and another function u l alpha. I uh, say you uh, here at uh, that is evaluated at another energy parameter, for example, and uh, so these. Uh, these additional basis functions only exist in the muffin tin spheres and uh, are zero in the interstitial region. And uh, they are constructed uh, such that we have these expansion coefficients a, b, and c, and we enforce that uh, we have zero uh, value on slope at the muffin tin sphere boundary and uh, also uh, a normalized uh, function. So um, there are different types of local orbitals. So most often, uh, we use local orbitals to describe these semi cost states. So, um, the problem with semi cost states actually is that uh, typically our energy parameters that we use for the LAPW basis are far away from these states. So, the linearization uh, actually does not uh, give a nice description for these states. And uh, therefore, we need uh, this additional basis function uh, to describe it. And for this, we use an additional energy parameter for the state that is near the semi cost state. And uh, then we have a nice description for this as a valence electron. So then we don't describe the semi cost state as a core state, but as a valence state. Uh, you can also use uh, these local orbitals to um, uh, improve the description uh, within the range of the unoccupied states if you use uh, energy parameters above the Fermi energy. So this may be useful if you uh, use FLIR as an input for GW calculations, for example. And if you are uh, interested in only um, improving the description for the valence electrons, then you can also put as a third uh, radial function uh, U double dot, so a second energy derivative, and uh, then you have a, uh, well, then you eliminate the uh, linearization error and uh, you are left with some higher order error. So, um, another specialty, or one specialty of uh, the FLIR code, um, that is uh, the treatment of film systems. And uh, the special thing here is that uh, a film uh, uh, geometry breaks the periodicity in one direction. So, um, you saw that our basis set actually is uh, periodic in or it, it is adapted to a periodic system. We have these plane waves in the interstitial region. And uh, of course, this is a problem um, because uh, these film systems don't have this periodicity. And there are different ways of um, dealing with this problem. So the most common approach is to perform periodic slab calculations where you just uh, uh, place a thin film in a unit cell that also features a large vacuum region, and then you have uh, repeating slabs uh, that are separated by a large vacuum. 
But of course, this is not very efficient because you have to invest many, many basis functions into describing vacuum. So in FLIRP, you have a different option. And uh, as I heard, uh, this may actually be kind of exclusive for uh, LAPW codes and uh, within the uh, community of LAPW codes. Um, uh, at least I'm not aware of any other LAPW code that has this. We, uh, we can adapt the basis set to also cover uh, the vacuum above and below the, FLIR, uh, the, the, the film explicitly. And of course, uh, we also want to uh, simulate surfaces, and we can do this by increasing the film thickness. Um, so before I forget to uh, say something about the nice picture that I have here on, on the right side, uh, this is actually uh, a work, uh, this is uh, quite old, but um, there you can see uh, an application of uh, how we um, uh, deal with such a uh, film setup, and uh, we had there some experimental work um, that saw a stripe like pattern um, on some material. I forgot what it was, uh, but you can also see here that uh, there are regions where we have a strong contrast, and there are regions where the contrast is uh, very, very, um, very, very low. And uh, the question is, uh, why is that so? And um, actually, uh, when you do the DFT calculations, you find out that uh, the ground state of the system is a spin spiral. So, uh, uh, and this this uh, this explains why why the contrast is so so different there. So the spins are aligned in a different uh, uh, orientation there. So let me show you how we deal with these uh, uh, film setups. So. Here we have um, an additional region, so the vacuum region um, above and below the film, and we treat it similarly to um, how we treated the um, the uh, muffin tin spheres. So we have um, uh, functions u and u dot in the vacuum, and also these a and b matching coefficients to ensure a, um, continuity in value and slope. And of course, these are not uh, solutions to the uh, within the uh, uh, Muffetin spheres, but uh, are solutions within the vacuum. So, um, let me uh, discuss uh, how to obtain high precision results with FLUR. So, you may have already guessed that uh, we have uh, many, many parameters in FLUR. So, for example, we have this Kmux uh, cutoff, uh, which is a reciprocal plane wave cutoff of, for the LAPW basis. We have uh, these Lmux cutoffs in each muffin tin sphere for the uh, angular momentum expansion of the LAPW basis. We have the muffin tin sphere radii. We have the energy parameters. We have uh, uh, a reciprocal plane wave cutoff for the density and the potential. Uh, we have uh, parameters that define where the vacuum boundary is, and so on and so on. And of course, the question is, uh, how uh, do we obtain stable results with this? And uh, of course, um, so these are many, many um, parameters, and uh, probably in other codes you have less. Uh, for example, in uh, pseudo-potential codes you have for sure less, but uh, some of these parameters uh, may just be hidden away in the or similarities to these parameters may be hidden away in the construction of the pseudo potential. So, for example, in the pseudo potential construction, you also have certain radii, and uh, I don't know what you have. And um, so, I will discuss a few examples that show how um, a problematic setup for LAPW and uh, FLUOR can be uh, controlled to actually obtain a nice and high precision result results and um, I will start with a discussion uh, the discussion of uh, these ghost bands and what you see here is the band structure of vanadium and actually um, you see here this very very flat band uh, slightly be low five electron volts above the Fermi energy and uh, this looks kind of damaged and it actually uh, such a ghost band and it is due to the 3p states. So you see in the upper right uh, side um, corner uh, where vanadium is, and there are actually not so many electrons here in the valence uh, 
um, in the Valence region. And the three P states on the other side here um, are therefore kind of extended. And um, yeah, in this setup, we uh, describe this as um, core electron states. And you see that we have these uh, ghost bands there. But if we actually uh, take these three, three P states and put them into the valence band and add in a local orbital to describe them, we end up with this band structure and this is uh, how it should look like. And actually, I have to say that I cheated a little bit to get this nice ghost band because uh, the default setup in FLUOR actually gives you this uh, nice setup with the uh, semicolon local orbital uh, in uh, the FLUOR import file. So another uh, aspect that uh, we should discuss is the choice of the energy parameter. So on this slide, you actually see uh, the dependence of the total energy. So on the left, on the y-axis, you uh, see the total energy relative to some offset. And uh, on the x-axis, you see the choice of uh, one of the energy parameters. So, and you see the dependence of the total energy on this choice. So, of course, um, what you actually want to have is uh, no dependence at all. So you want to have very, very stable results. Um, the energy parameters is kind of an artificial uh, numerical parameter that you put into this LAPW basis, and uh, your results should not depend on that. So there are different ways of choosing the energy parameter automatically. So I marked here two uh, of them. So the atomic energy parameters or the energy center of mass method, and none of them gives optimal results. And uh, even if you have the optimal result for the LAPW basis, this uh, may actually not be uh, without a linearization error. So, but if we add local orbitals, these higher derivative local orbitals here to the basis, we see that we get uh, super stable results. Uh, so in the inset here, uh, this is a highlight, uh, this is a zoom into this uh, low region with the uh, red uh, curve, this, uh, which is very constant. And you see that uh, our results are actually stable uh, with respect to about one uh, micro heart tree of difference that we see there. So this is uh, uh, quite uh, quite stable, I would say. Um, also, I want to add here, I have an example for FCC Serio. And uh, so this is kind of special. It features a very uh, large um, linearization error because of it has, a, it has a very large Martin sphere and so on. And uh, Another aspect of the system, so um, if, uh, of course, we also have uh, an effect of this on uh, physical quantities that we uh, are interested in. So here I show the experimental, uh, no, the um, theoretically determined equilibrium uh, lattice constant uh, relative to the experimental lattice constant. Uh, this is an LDA calculation. And uh, I show the dependence of this on the muffin tin sphere radius. So again, this is some artificial numerical parameter. And we should not see any uh, dependence on this parameter. And of course, uh, uh, you saw with LAPW, you get um, a linearization error. And uh, so therefore, there is a dependence. So the, li the linearization all only uh, takes place in the Muffin-Tin sphere. So if you reduce the Muffin-Tin sphere radius, also the linearization error gets smaller. And therefore, therefore this uh, dependence is there. But if you add these uh, local orbitals, uh, either these higher derivative local orbitals or even uh, local orbitals for this description of unoccupied bands, these halo-type local orbitals, then uh, you reduce this dependence and uh, you end up with very stable results. So actually this is uh, kind of uh, even a quality criterion for LPW basis uh, calculations. So if uh, you can uh, get rid of such a dependency, you know that your description uh, in uh, the uh, Muffet-Tin sphere as well as the um, 
the interstitial region uh, is very, very good. And you get high precision results. So this is actually one of the claims that we do for the FLIR code or for LAPW in general, that we can uh, produce uh, highly precise results. So uh, let's go to uh, the strengths, challenges, and features of FLIR. And uh, the last two points also. And um, as I showed you, and I hope uh, that uh, um, I, I was, uh, uh, that uh, the, the message, uh, message arrived you. Uh, we have the possibility uh, to produce precise reference results with this uh, uh, method. So, um, yeah. And uh, of course, um, we are good in everything where the core electrons are of direct relevance. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, Jens Bröder made this study, uh, this high throughput study on. Um, XPS spectra, and uh, for that he uh, made core hole uh, calculations where he actually uh, modified the occupation of the uh, core electron states and uh, to uh, calculate uh, his spectra. So this is one example where you can uh, directly use this. Of course, uh, the LPW uh, method in general is uh, uh, perfect for, or it's uh, very, very good for um, uh, describing um, elements uh, that include F electrons in the valence shell, and of course, also all other elements within the periodic table. So if you have uh, some setup that includes something like this, uh, using FLAPW uh, is a good idea. So um, we are good at a complex magnetism, spin orbit coupling, and you will see uh, an example of this uh, in the talk by Juliana Alexeva that uh, comes next. And, uh, but there are, of course, also challenges in LAPW. And um, for example, um, the, uh, if you want to uh, perform uh, some uh, relaxations of the structure, um, or, or uh, you, you, want, you, want to, uh, you are interested in the stress tensor, or you're interested in the phonons, the phonon uh, dispersion relations, uh, you will see when you want to um, uh, formulate the expressions that you need in the calculation of uh, these quantities that uh, the LAPW basis is so sophisticated that uh, these expressions get uh, kind of complicated. And uh, so therefore, we are lagging a little bit behind when it comes to the implementation of uh, such quantities, but uh, there is uh, development going on. And of course, uh, there also is this constraint of non-overlapping of tin spheres that we have. And uh, if you do structural relaxations, um, your move, atoms move uh, with respect to each other. And uh, so you may end up in a situation where they actually crash into each other. And uh, well, that is not good for LAPW because then you have to reduce the muffin sphere radius and uh, do the calculation again. So um, FLIR has many features and this is an incomplete list. Uh, as already mentioned, we can treat uh, non-collinear magnetism, uh, spin orbit coupling. Uh, we can describe spin spirals with a, a generalized block theorem. We can extract uh, the parameters for the Heisenberg model, uh, even the extended Heisenberg model. So, for example, these exchange coupling parameters, uh, parameters for the chalefinsky moria interaction, uh, mag uh, magnetocrystalline anisotropy, and so on. And uh, one option to extract this is with the magnetic force theorem. So, this is uh, uh, computationally efficient way to get these quantities. Uh, we have uh, different uh, or many uh, exchange correlation functionals, including LDA plus U and hybrid functionals. Uh, we can apply uh, external fields, uh, perform uh, calculations on yield spectra, um, calculate uh, magnetic circular dichroism, uh, do band unfolding, calculate uh, vacuum density of states. This is, for example, important if you want to simulate uh, uh, images uh, coming from a scanning tunneling microscope. And uh, with uh, the specs code together, we can uh, 
uh, or the specs code ca can work in combination with FLIR together to uh, perform uh, a GW approximation to many body perturbation theory and there you can also get uh, many quantities out and uh, many more features. And um, this is uh, a short slide uh, to sketch the usage of FLIR. Uh, you will learn much more about this in the talk by uh, Daniel Wortmann. So, um, of course, um, FLIR requires this complex parametrization and of course the user cannot do this by hand. So, therefore, we uh, have an input file generator and the user only has to provide basic structural input to this input file generator. So this is like uh, the Bravais matrix and where in the unit cell uh, which atom is. And uh, this input generator then um, generates a FLIR input file that has material adapted default parameters. And um, the user then, uh, then can modify this input file. So if he wants to uh, uh, make sure that uh, there is convergence with respect to a certain parameter. He can increase the cutoff parameters, uh, he can uh, enable special calculation modes and so on. So, um, of course, uh, this uh, kind of usage workflow is also automatized by uh, AIDA. So, there is an AIDA FLIR plugin and uh, which can be used to um, have uh, automatized calculations, uh, but you will see uh, or hear more on this in the talk by Daniel Wortmann. Uh, so I will conclude my talk here. Uh, we discussed many, many things. Uh, I showed you the RAPW basis, local orbitals, film setups. I uh, demonstrated you how, how we obtain highly stable, uh, high precision results in FLIR, uh, how, how uh, quality criteria uh, for such calculations may look like. And uh, I also gave you an overview about the strengths, challenges and features of FLIR and uh, mentioned the FLIR input files. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, you can go to our website www.flapw.de, uh, get the code there. We have a very extensive documentation there uh, that you will find hopefully very useful if you want to try out the code. And uh, you probably saw that I did not, did not give any references in the talk, um, but there are many, many ref references to everything I said on the website. Uh, so please go there. And now, um, please, Uliana, take over and uh, start with your talk. Thank you. Good morning also from my side. My name is Uliana Alekseva and uh, the title of my talk is Pushing Flora to the Limits, uh, Large Magnetic Setups. My talk will uh, consist of two parts, parallelization and optimization uh, and then the first part and then I will give some examples uh, with simulations of complex magnetic objects. Let's start with the, with the general FLAPW uh, self-consistency cycle. We start with the initial guess. We put an initial charge density into this cycle and then we calculate potential. Uh, then we set up the matrices for the generalized eigenvalue problem and then we solve this eigenvalue problem by diagonalization. Then we calculate new charge density and we check the convergent, convergent, phew, converges. If it uh, did not converge, then we repeat the procedure. Uh, usually we repeat it uh, 20 to 100 times. These four parts of the code are very different algorithmically and then behave differently. On the last column, you can see the percentage of the time it could take. And you see that the most computationally intensive parts are metric setup and diagonalization. They also scale differently, only potential scale quadratically with the system size, all three other scale cubically. You can see here that I put several boxes that represents the fact that uh, sometimes we need to calculate several so-called k-points 
sometimes few, sometimes many. And in this case, uh, we get several independent eigenvalue problems. Uh, this will be important in the parallelization. We want to run our code on a modern supercomputer. And a modern supercomputer is a very hierarchical system. It consists usually of many nodes uh, connected by a network. And inside a node, we have a few CPU units. And usually we also have, uh, not usually, but uh, sometimes and uh, very often we have uh, some kind of accelerator inside. And this slide, it's uh, Xeon Phi, but uh, it can be also GPU or something else. A CPU unit is also a, a parallel system. It has many cores and each core can uh, work with one instruction on the, um, on the vector of data. Inside the code, uh, the memory is shared. Every core can, uh, inside, what, is, what did I say? Inside, inside the node, um, memory is shared. Every core can see the memory uh, and uh, directly access the memory of another core. Um, <clears throat> to, to be able to run effectively on uh, such a system, we need to reflect uh, this level of parallelism in, in, the, in the implementation. And we have MPI for memory passage, OpenMP for multi-threading, and uh, of course, uh, vectorization. Actually, we have two levels of MPI parallelization. Um, Uh, the, the, the top one is parallelization of a key point. As I mentioned, uh, the, when we have a uh, few key points to, uh, to simulate, this gives us uh, independent eigenvalue problems. And this is very fortunate because if we distribute it over uh, different MPI processes, then these processes do not communicate too much. So we would expect an ideal scaling. And as you see on this plot, this is indeed the case. This is a speed up plot. We have number of nodes along the X size and a factor of speed up on the uh, Y axis, along the uh, Y axis. Uh, that means uh, it's plotted um, how much faster the code runs on this amount of nodes. And uh, you see the, this light blue line is an ideal scaling and the real me uh, measurement of the code follows closely uh, this line. Uh, each node on, of this machine has 48 cores and uh, we start 48 MPI processes here because we have very many K points. And uh, on 16 nodes, we start, uh, start uh, 768 MPI. So it's uh, quite a lot. Uh, the next level, oh, then how do I? The next level of uh, parallelization is uh, parallelization over eigenvectors. This gives us an additional speed up, as you can see on this plot. It's again a speed up against number of nodes. This line is ideal scaling. Uh, this magenta, which is hidden behind the blue one is the scaling of the total uh, uh, calculation. Uh, it's not ideal, but it's uh, still good. The three different lines are the scaling, separate scaling of uh, parts of the code. And uh, this percentage so, uh, shows the um, how, how much how much time it took compared to the whole uh, iteration, and uh, matrix and um, matrix setup and diagonalization uh, here combined together uh, take uh, more than ninety percent of the uh, iteration time. Another reason why we could uh, why we would use the eigenvector parallelization is uh, that it reduces the amount of memory pay MPI process. As uh, a system under consideration grows, 
the memory conception of the code scale quadratically. Um, so at some point we um, would uh, achieve the situation when the, our matrices do not fit on one node anymore. The memory, uh, how the memory usage reduce uh, can be seen on this uh, slide. Uh, we start here with uh, 18 gigabyte per MPI process and then it goes down uh, up to two gigabyte. And this, uh, this behavior is very usual. First, the memory consumption drops and then reaches a minimum and uh, do not decrease anymore. And this brings us uh, to the uh, next level of parallelization, because again, uh, as the system size grows, at some point we achieve the situation when we cannot fill the node only with MPI processes, we need to use the, uh, the shared memory parallelism. And in Floor, it is uh, quite efficient, as you can see here. This is the speed up for the intranode scaling. The scaling of the whole iteration is the, uh, the red dots. I do not have a special slide for the vectorization because we don't do it explicitly. We either rely of, uh, on the external uh, libraries, which are already multi-threaded and vectorized, uh, or we uh, use compiler hands. During the Max project, we optimized uh, the code a lot. This is the comparison between the old one, the pre-Max version, this magenta line, and the version of 2018. These two lines. The difference between them is that the light blue is pure MPI um, run, and uh, this is the uh, hybrid version, MPI plus OpenMP. The system is not uh, so big, so the difference between these two are not very prominent, but it is there. And if you compare the, um, uh, the performance of the code on 16 nodes, the speed up uh, comparing to the old one is more than four times. This is not a speed up plot, as you could mention. This is execution time plotted against the number of nodes. So uh, uh, this is for one iteration and one key point. We did not stop there, of course. Now we are able to simulate very large unit cells. You can see it on this uh, plot. This is against the execution time against number of nodes. This system has thousands of atoms. This system has 2,000 of atoms. Uh, this is almost 4,000. The um, structure of uh, the atomic structure of the system uh, uh, you see here, it's an extended effect. Um, one iteration, one self consistency cycle on 1,000 nodes takes 100 minutes. That was my part about parallelization and optimization. Let's now move to, to magnetism. FLIR is the code to simulate complex magnetic phenomena because it's full potential, because it's all electron, because it takes into account relativistic effects and spin orbit, uh, orbit coupling, because it uh, can deal with non-collinear magnetic systems, because it can work on crystals and foams, because it can simulate spine spirals and so on and so on. That is, this is all uh, very well known. But when we want to move uh, to simulation of large magnetic objects, usually is a um, multi-scale approach uh, is used. We, that means we ca first calculate uh, some fundamental material properties with an ap uh, initial code such as FLOR, and then using these constant, we perform spin uh, dynamic simulation. And this is a very effective approach and very widely used, but spin dynamic simulations do not take into account the dependence of the electronic structure from the magnetic structure. 
So it would be very interesting to, uh, to be able to simulate such system with floor and take into account high order interactions, long range interactions and validate these magnetic models. Now, when we move to the non-collinear magnetism, magnetic models of, uh, of the code, these two parts of the code, magnetic setup and diagonalization, they remain the most computationally intensive parts. But the Hamiltonian now uh, is two times, well, uh, actually four times larger, because we do not only consider uh, spin up, spin up, and spin down, spin down uh, independently. We uh, need to include uh, spin up, spin down part, and we need to um, to consider the matrix as a whole. So don't be surprised that our large magnetic uh, setups are not as large as non-magnetic. And now I'm going to give you two examples of what is what is possible now with FLOR. First one is a series of Skinman tubes and manganese germanium supercell. Each of these system has uh, 500 atoms and uh, to run a simulation with K point uh, on 256 nodes, to run one uh, self-consistency cycle is just uh, 10 minutes. So it's very fast. And my second example is um, a globule, again in manganese germanium. This magnetic uh, object has to block points at its edges. And in macromagnetic models, it uh, represented a singularity where the magnetization vanishes. This implies that uh, there are some drastic changes in the electronic structure. And of course, it's very interesting to investigate with such a code as Flora. For this kind of system, the conversion, uh, convergence uh, costs about 2 million core hours on this wonderful machine that is SuperMOOC. So that's, now I'm, uh, I'm at the end of my talk. Uh, I talked about parallelization and optimization of the FLOR code. We have a hybrid parallelization scheme, MPI plus OpenMP, and it gives us a possibility to simulate large unit cells with over 1,000 atoms. And I gave you two examples of what is possible now for simulations of large magnetic setups. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, good morning. My name is Daniel Wortmann and uh, I guess it's now my job uh, uh, to finish this webinar with the last presentation. And um, my theme will be uh, mainly the question of what you have to do to use FLIR yourself. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, after, uh, oops, sorry. After uh, these first two presentations, uh, you are now uh, so interested in these kind of all electron DFT calculations. Perhaps you also want to treat magnetism or complex electronic material so that you want to use FLIR yourself. And um, the main point uh, uh, of entry um, for FLIR users should be our webpage, as uh, was already mentioned several times. Um, and uh, I put here a, a short. Uh, picture of, of the web page just to give you an idea and uh, uh, the, the main point you probably want to start with is the documentation so we have a user guide uh, which uh, covers most of the subjects which might be interesting for you uh, and uh, essentially also gives the, the background again similar like like Gregor has given in his talk um, but we also have tutorials uh, in particular we have a tutorial from 2019 which essentially gives you a chance to go step by step through a series of calculations and, and learn how to, how to use FLIR. Um, if you want to use FLIR, the question is of course, uh, what kind of uh, machine is uh, suitable for that? And uh, the first thing you have to know is that uh, we do not provide any binaries to you. So if you want to run your machine on your laptop or on some kind of supercomputer, uh, like uh, the one in Jülich shown here, um, you have to, to uh, compile FLIR yourself. 
Um, and uh, in order to be able to do that, you need a couple of things, which hopefully your system administrator uh, provides uh, for you. Um, first, you need a, a good Fortran compiler uh, and a corresponding uh, C compiler, which is compatible to that. Um, you need the libxml2 library um, in order to be able to read our input file, which is an XML file. Um, and you need uh, some basic mathematical libraries, in particular the BLAS and the LAPAC libraries. Um, and uh, you should make uh, sure that these are well optimized for your system. You also need the CMake tool um, in order to generate a make file and in order to build then, then flow. Um, in, in general, we have good experience with uh, using the Intel toolchain. Um, so the Intel compilers and uh, uh, the libraries, but we also use uh, GFortran, GCC, and uh, the PGI or NVIDIA compilers. In addition to this very basic requirements, uh, Fleur can also take advantage of uh, several additional libraries. Uh, first, of course, as you learned, uh, you uh, want probably to need to use uh, 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 the MPI library in order to be able to run uh, the code on uh, distributed memory machines. Um, but uh, also very useful is uh, to compile with the HDF5 uh, library, which gives you a structured uh, input and output of large binary data, in particular of the charge density, and uh, uh, is, is a quite useful uh, to, to, uh, library to use. You can also link with the libxc library to get many uh, exchange correlation functionals in addition to the, those built in. Uh, you can use uh, uh, SPFFT library from the Max project to have a fast FFT library, uh, or you could also uh, link with a, with a Vanya library to generate and use a Vanya functions at flow. Uh, quite crucial is, and that's something you should probably uh, remember, that uh, for good performance uh, of Fleur, um, you need to solve a dense eigenvalue problem, and therefore you need a very good solver for that. Uh, and uh, that should be somewhat tuned to your architecture. And uh, we actually provide interfaces to a lot of these kind of, of libraries, and you should uh, check what is available on your machine. So uh, for example, you, you should use something like a vendor lab park, like, like the MKL library from Intel, for example, or uh, we also have uh, interfaces to Scala park, to LPAR, to Magma, Elemental, and, and some others. Okay, so the basic procedure, if you want to start with Fleur, uh, is uh, relatively simple. You can download our configuration script from our web page uh, and then uh, run, that, uh, uh, run that script. And uh, 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 the script will then download the FLIR code and uh, 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 generate a, a directory in which you then can compile um, uh, with make. Uh, a little bit more elaborate. Uh, you can, of course, also download the source code. Um, preferable, you do a git clone from our git repository, uh, and then you run the configuration script, which creates, as I said, the build directory. You can also download some dependencies, like, for example, the HDF5 library, and uh, then run uh, CMake to determine your compilers and uh, all the, the options needed. Um, the configure script has a manage H option, which you can use to see what uh, you might want to tune for your system, and you should also check the documentation here. And finally, you always have to run then make in, in the build directory. Okay, now I would like to show you a very short live demonstration. I hope this somehow works. Uh, uh, I have to share now this other image, this other window. Oops. I hope this, that you can see it now. Um, so this is a, a very short live demonstration, which we also have on our web page. Uh, and it shows you uh, essentially the basic steps you have to do um, with, uh, with uh, Fleur. Um, so uh, as I said, uh, the first thing you might be interested in is that um, what, what you essentially need when you want to, to run Fleur, and uh, this is uh, what is already provided in this example, is of course the Fleur code, which uh, was compiled, and this input generator, which generates the basic input. And we do that by providing a very simple input file, which is here a simple input file for silicon, and we can actually look at it, it's shown here in this, uh, uh, in this uh, 
uh, editor, and you see that it's a very simple example of silicon. So we have a comment here, we define the lattice, uh, we define that we have two atoms, uh, the atomic number is 14, we have two atom positions for silicon, and we also define something for the K-point set. And uh, what you then uh, essentially just do is um, you, you uh, use this input generator uh, with this uh, very simple input file uh, to generate the more complex input. And what you see here already is that the several files have been generated. For example, a file for the symmetry, but you also see that there's a file for the structure of the system, which you can visualize with corresponding viewers. Um, but uh, the most important thing is that we now generated this XML input file um, for the FLIR, which contains all these parameters uh, which are used in a FLIR calculation and which you might want to modify and tune. And here you can actually switch on all the features. And uh, 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 Gregor already, of course, discussed uh, quite, quite a few of these parameters, but you see there are, there are many more. So we have parameters for the calculation setup. Uh, you find the cell again, of course, uh, information about the symmetry, about the exchange correlation functional, and you find uh, information about the atoms, things like this um, uh, muffin tin radius here, um, parameterization of the grid, LMAX cutoffs, and so on. And of course, you also find the atomic positions. And uh, once you have this file, you can, of course, now modify it and adjust it to your needs. Um, and uh, uh, what you also can do is, of course, you can run again the input generator with minus H option to see what, what other things you might want to do. For example, you might want to include more parameters needed for magnetism. So this uh, file does not by default contain all the parameters uh, which are possible uh, to make it a bit uh, uh, more user-friendly to read. Okay, and once you have then this file, you can then simply start uh, the FLIR code and uh, it will then start running and uh, working on that file. So this is a very simple example. So what you can see is we simply have uh, nine iterations here which were performed. The, FLIR, the code uh, prints out uh, the charge distance of each iteration. So you see that in the beginning, this is not a converged calculation and at the end it's relatively converged already. And uh, in addition to that, you see here with the files that there are a lot of files generated. There is a, a, a charge density file, of course, generated. Uh, but there are also output files, something more human readable, and some XML file for more automatic processing. And in this output file, you, you find a lot of information, uh, which uh, you can, of course, read. But you can, of course, also uh, simply grab for something. For example, you could look at the convergence of the total energy, uh, or you could um, uh, look again at the convergence of the of the charge distance as we we just have seen. So that's uh, the basic procedure which uh, we we follow when we when we do a FLIR calculation. Uh, now I have to switch uh, back. Uh, hopefully this works to the PowerPoint. Uh, so that's a basic procedure, but uh, you might nevertheless run into the situation that you need some more support and more help. And there, again, we would like to point out there is a web page. Uh, you can have a look at the documentation at the web page. There's also a mailing list. Um, so you can register to this mailing list here and ask questions there and, and get help there. Uh, we also have an issue tracker on, on, on our Git, which we use for development, uh, where, of course, mainly bugs uh, are reported. But also, you can report there if you have uh, trouble and, and problem. And there's also the Max help desk you might uh, want to, to contact. I've seen in the question that quite a substantial amount of people uh, in the audience are already uh, using uh, GPUs and are interested in, in GPUs. And the good news is that uh, there is a uh, implementation of FLIR running on GPUs. Um, unfortunately, that's uh, still pretty much a topic for experienced users, um, mainly um, probably because uh, uh, on the one hand, it's, it's work in progress, and on the other hand, um, we use CUDA Fortran and OpenACC, uh, and therefore, uh, at the moment, we are pretty much restricted to the BGI or NVIDIA compilers. And uh, again, we have this problematic part uh, of having a good library for dense matrix diagonalization, where, to our knowledge at the moment, Alpha and Magma are probably the most uh, interesting to use. And uh, uh, in our experience, it's a rather complex procedure to get actually FLIR to run 
and uh, on, on, on GPUs and, and get all these dependencies correctly. Um, but we are working on that and hopefully make, make uh, progress. Uh, so please uh, stay tuned if you are interested in that. And if you are uh, really uh, very desperate, please contact us for, for direct help and support here. Uh, the last uh, thing I want to cover is that uh, we have a, a plugin for uh, the AIDA uh, environment. So if you are interested in high throughput computing uh, using the FLIR code, um, this provides you a possibility to do that within uh, the AIDA framework, which is of course very useful, not only for high throughput, but also because it stores essentially the full provenance of the input and the output and all the calculations. Um, you will find a link on the on the Fleur homepage for the uh, um, AIDA Fleur uh, plugin, um, but you can also try it out using the Quantum Mobile from the Materials Cloud, where uh, AIDA and uh, Fleur and the plugin are uh, installed. Uh, so the basic things the uh, AIDA Fleur plugin provides is uh, support for this process, so support for the input generator of Fleur to generate these Fleur specific parameters. Uh, and also um, uh, uh, parsers for the FLIR input and output files uh, in order to, uh, to handle the data there. Um, also uh, uh, some specialized data types for the FLIR input data and uh, possibilities to modify, uh, modify the computational parameters. Uh, also included are some tools for XML handling and plotting and things like that. Most useful is of course that AIDA uh, has a possibility to uh, provide you with uh, complex workflows that encapsulate um, uh, key tasks you want to do. So rather complex uh, uh, calculations uh, can then be made accessible relatively easily. And we have already uh, quite a few of such uh, uh, relatively advanced workflows in particular for, of course, for magnetic properties, um, which uh, then uh, are built into this uh, AIDA uh, FLIR plugin. Okay, um, at, uh, coming now uh, slowly to the end of, of the webinar, I would like to give you a short idea of what our plans are for the future. Um, of course, uh, we will continue working on uh, porting and tuning FLIR uh, for uh, HPC architectures. In particular, of course, uh, we are working heavily on this GPU issue. But we also, of course, are interested in stability and interoperability with AIDA for more complex workflows and uh, to improve, in general, the user's experience. Um, we also uh, uh, work on uh, uh, hybrid functionals. Uh, so we try to extend, essentially, um, the uh, scaling uh, capabilities you have seen uh, we, we have in FLIR by now into, into hybrid functionals, so make them available on HPC systems as well um, and uh, make it possible to treat many at hundreds of atoms with, with hybrid functionals and also to com uh, 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 encapsulate these operations uh, uh, for, for further use. Um, if you are a developer of a DFT code, you might also, might also be interested in the activities of the MAX project, where essentially modular, modularization, oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, is, a, is, a, is a big issue. And uh, we try to make our, our code uh, consisting of independent modules and inde independent libraries. Um, and uh, therefore, we also provide some standalone features, which might be interesting if you are a developer of some, some DFT code. So for example, we have this Laxlib library together with the quantum espresso code, which is used in both codes, which uh, provides a generalized interface to linear algebra libraries. Um, and, uh, but we also have something uh, for the common tasks of probably every DFT code uh, like uh, timing, error handling, and the HDF IO, which we encapsulated in our uh, UDFT library. Uh, so if you're interested in these, uh, you, can, you can also find them and uh, you might be interested in them. Okay, as a summary uh, of our uh, webinar today, um, we, we try to present to you FLIR as a very versatile tool uh, for, for very high accurate DFT calculations and simulations. We showed you the, the basic theory and the basic method behind that. 
we showed you a little bit uh, what is relevant for high performance computing using FLIR and what is possible now using this code in particular with respect to large magnetic systems. And I tried to give you a short uh, glimpse of the practical aspects of, of FLIR usage. Uh, so the question of how you actually can use FLIR yourself. And uh, uh, again, I would like to point out a good starting point there is, is uh, always uh, the, the, the homepage of the code. Um, before we, uh, we close, I would like uh, to point out that uh, there will be another uh, webinar coming. Uh, so uh, on uh, uh, the big DFT uh, code. So the people from uh, France uh, will uh, give an idea about wavelets for electronic structure calculations in, in large systems in uh, uh, November. Uh, so please also join that, uh, that webinar. Okay, with that, uh, I think we are through and uh, I thank you very much for your ex uh, attention. Um, I think we will stay online a little bit to answer further questions if uh, uh, any of these questions arise or are not answered by now. Um, so please uh, feel free to use the question and uh, answer box uh, to, to post further questions and we will try our best uh, to come up with uh, uh, good uh, answers there. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, it's Francesco here, and the uh, and the Max responsible for the for the outreach and the communication activities. Uh, and uh, I'm very glad to to have you all in here for this uh, wonderful webinar today. So a lot of engagement for from the audience. Uh, and uh, before wrapping up. Uh, um, I would like to invite you to, of course, to follow our next webinar on the 12th of November. And uh, mm, I can see there are a couple of open questions from uh, Halabad in, uh, in the chat. As, uh, one of them is uh, standing there since a few minutes. So maybe, maybe Daniel, uh, before wrapping up and closing, uh, uh, we have still a couple of uh, three, four minutes to get back to Halabad. Uh, and then he's asking, uh, would there be any video tutorials to properly utilize FLIR? If not, any chance of a workshop based on FLIR? Um, we actually are, have a couple of videos from our last uh, workshop, uh, mainly uh, the, the talks we gave there. Uh, so um, usually we, we, we try to make uh, hands-on tutorials for FLIR. Um, regularly um, and uh, one is actually scheduled again uh, next uh, spring. Um, probably it will not be in person uh, this time. So uh, I guess we will produce a kind of more online uh, material then as, as well. Um, but there are some talks which you can, can see there. And as I said, there's also this uh, uh, kind of uh, tutorial which uh, guides you through the different steps uh, you, you need to do with uh, when you, when you start a flow calculation. Okay, cool. I think we got a bit of time to pick up Eric's question as well. Ian, Eric is asking, does FLIR uh, enable to treat LDA, GGA band gap problems? I heard that this code mm -hmm. formally is very accurate. Yeah, I would say, uh, I would say that uh, of course, um, the, the LAPW method is supposed to provide essentially a very accurate uh, answer of the DFT problem. So essentially, uh, our strength that is that we really solve uh, the, we really give the, 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 the answer which you should expect from DFT without much further approximation. However, of course, this LDA GGA problem is something different, right? That's a, a, a question of uh, the exchange correlation treatment and uh, the, um, whether the band gap is correct is then an, another question again. So in, in principle, that's not, uh, the, the question of accuracy is not uh, covered there within the LAPW method, but there you have to do different strategies. For example, you could use these hybrid functionals, uh, which uh, we, we, are, we, we have in the code and we are working on to make them also more scalable. Um, or you could, could use something like LDA plus U or other approaches, or for example, then go to DW. But that's of course a, a question that's not LAPW specific, but that's more a, a DFT question. And um, so uh, in, in that sense, we are in the same situation as, as all the other DFT concepts. 
So very good. Yes. Uh, we are running a bit out of time, and I think we can uh, give a last, last chance to Sue Joey. Uh, excuse me if I got wrong your name. And uh, yes. he's asking, is there any time comparison available for SCF cycles between this fluor code <laughs> and the pseudo potential based codes like VASP or Quantum Espresso? It's a very uh, tricky one. Yes, of course, of course, we, we, we look at that. The, the problem is a little bit that it's, it's usually relatively difficult to come up with, with comparisons of different T BFT codes, which can be considered a, a fair comparison, right? Because each of these codes have advantages in, in different areas, right? And um, uh, in, in particular, for example, uh, VASP and quantum espresso usually care a lot about the number of electrons they have in the system because they usually use iterative solvers. And um, uh, that's, on the other hand, not a big issue for us, right? And uh, therefore, it's, it's always a bit, a bit uh, uh, difficult to compare. In general, I would, I would guess we are still, for most systems, uh, slightly slower than these codes. But of course, we are trying to, to keep up and uh, we try to, to improve here. Uh, also, of course, the scaling sometimes is slightly different um, uh, in, in, in the different codes. Um, for example, of course, in, for, for very, very large systems, also these codes usually tend to be limited by the generalized eigenvalue problem they have to solve in the iterative solver at some point. And then, of course, we will end up in a very, with, with very similar problems in, 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 in very, in the very la uh, for, for very large systems. Thank you very, very much, Daniel. Very informative to the point. So I'm really wrapping up in here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this webinar as much as we did. Uh, we saw a lot of engagement and uh, we're truly, truly happy about that. I would like to thank you all for joining us today and to um, stay tuned with, uh, with the Max channels because uh, we, have a lot, uh, we have a lot in our, in our plate in the coming weeks and uh, we will uh, catch up for the for the next webinar in November. And of course, you have all the contacts from the speakers to, well, to ask for further curiosity or whichever you, you might want to know. So thank you again and uh, have a good day and take care. Goodbye.